Justice uh, Committee if you can do your needful with any electronic devices. And at this stage of the meeting, if there's any interests to declare, financial or otherwise, related to today's business, now's the time to do so. Chair, can I declare an interest in item 7 as a family member who is a lay magistrate? Okay, no problem. Duly noted. Um, apologies. I think everyone's here. Um, Luke, Luke Beatty and Sinead Bradley are joining via the Starleaf facility. Okay, so that being the case, there will be no delegation of votes. With the exception of if one member needs to leave. Christine, do you want to just put that on the record? Yeah, um, Gemma Dolan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon, in the event that she has to leave the meeting early. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Item two, then, is the draft minutes of the meetings held on the 29th of September and the 1st of October. Pages five and six of your meeting pack relate to the 29th of September meeting, and if members are content that they're a true reflection of proceedings, then I will... Sign accordingly. Agreed. Agreed, yeah. Uh, and then pages 7 to 33 of the meeting pack are the draft minutes of the meeting that were held on the 1st of October. And again, if members are content that they're a true reflection of that meeting, then I'll sign them accordingly. Members agreed. agreed. Thank you. Matters arising, there's some items just to mention. Um, first item that I'll mention uh, on the 3rd of September, the committee agreed to write to the Secretary of State. Uh, for Northern Ireland, the Minister for Justice and the First and Deputy First Ministers to request an update on discussions taking place and any progress being made to identify how the actual victims' pension payments will be funded. Responses from the Minister for Justice and Secretary of State were discussed at our meeting last week. There is a response from the First and Deputy First Minister uh, that has been received at pages 35 and 36 of the meeting pack. And FMDFM have advised that they are entirely committed to delivering the scheme and acknowledge that it needs to be funded properly. And any further delay in payments to victims and survivors needs to be uh, avoided. Um, again, members, FMDFM also highlight that there is a shared view that adequate funding for the duration of the scheme should come from Westminster. And as the committee was informed last week, uh, they, along with the Finance Minister and Justice Minister, are continuing to seek those additional funds from the block grant from the Secretary of State and have requested an urgent meeting to take place with him. So the committee uh, had agreed to ask the Minister for Justice to provide regular updates on any developments regarding funding and the outcome of the meeting with the Secretary of State. So that correspondence is there for noting and we will continue to get an update from the Minister for Justice on it. Uh, item two on matters arising is the compensation payments for victims of sexual abuse in home. The departments responded to the committee requesting for clarification regarding the current position in respect of an individual that claims compensation for being sexually abused by a parent in the home. That response is page 38 and 39 of the meeting pack. The current Northern Ireland Criminal uh, Injuries Compensation Scheme 2009 permits such applications following the removal of the same household rule which took place on the 9th of June this year. The change to the legislation means that anyone previously denied compensation under the same household rule or put off from coming forward because of it will now be able to make a fresh application. So it's there for members to note. Item 3 is the forward work programme for uh, this month, pages 41 to 45. A date for the Minister coming to the committee is currently being identified. A um, bit of an issue in that the executive sits on a Thursday afternoon, as do we as committee, so we're just trying to work around that. Um, but as that date gets identified, we will slot it in and make sure it takes place. Item four on matters arising uh, is um, the Minister for Justice providing a copy of her response to the Women Resources and Development Agency in relation to parental alienation and its inclusion in the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. The Minister has indicated that she, nor the Minister of Health, that has policy responsibility for it, plan to bring uh, reference to parental alienation into the Bill as, ta as a tabled amendment. However, the Minister does indicate that patterns of this type of behaviour could be deemed to be abusive behaviour and potentially be captured by the domestic abuse offence, depending on the individual circumstances. And the Minister's response is on pages 3 and 5 of your tabled pack, so I know members would be familiar with that issue. One that we give consideration to as part of 
part of our deliberations. Um, so that letter's there for members to note. Item four, then, on the agenda. It's uh, an SL1 on the draft Justice 2016 Order 2020, um, pages 47 to 62, members of the meeting pack. The committee considered the proposal to make the Draft Justice Act 2016 Order 2020 <coughs> at its meeting on the 10th of September. The rule will add universal credit to the list of benefits from which deductions may be made for the payment of fines and other financial penalties under Part 1 of the Justice Act 2016. The committee agreed to seek further information from the Department on the legislative safeguards in place regarding the level of deductions that can be taken, the criteria used the evidence hardship, and how the addition of universal credit to the lists of benefits from which payments can be taken will be communicated to applicants and the advice sector. The Department's response sets out information from the Department of Communities regarding safeguards and considerations that are applied in respect of deductions from benefits. It states that fines are relatively low on the debt recovery priority order and will only be considered if all other options to apply a deduction that are set out in the letter have been met. The response also advises that the addition of credit will be communicated by the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service and the relevant NI Direct websites. So, members, at this stage, it's to indicate whether you intent with the proposed uh, statutory rule in light of the additional information that has been provided. Linda? I'll ask one question, and it's, it's slightly outside of this. Do they have the same rights to deduct from PAYE and, and other schemes as they do from benefits? I understand why this has been done, because obviously universal credit, there's an equity issue there if you're on ESA or different benefits, then they can be deducted, and if you're in a universal credit, they can't. But yes. do, you know, do, do we know the, the answer to that? I know things can be deducted from from wages, but I'm just not sure if this is part of that. Yes, like uh, yeah, child maintenance orders, for example, is one that comes out of the... My recollection of it is they can deduct from earnings, so they can make a earnings deduct. So I think that's the way they approach so it. There's, there's an, so an equity across earnings. the board. Yeah, they can um, apply to make deductions from earnings. Or earnings, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Sorry. Okay, members. Yep. You're okay. And then, um, right. item five: minor changes to the Human Trafficking <coughs> and Exploitation Act, uh, 2015. <coughs> the consultation responses and the proposed next steps, pages 64 to 92. At our meeting on the 30th of June, the committee considered uh, the information that had been provided by the department on the proposal to undertake an eight-week consultation. Um, during the summer on two potential amendments. Uh, the proposed amendments uh, would remove the statutory requirement to publish a strategy annually and extend the support to pol uh, potential victims of slavery, servitude and forced or compulsory labour. In addition to queries regarding the consultation process, the committee agreed to seek further information on the rationale for the proposed removal of the statutory requirement to publish an annual strategy. And in its response dated 1st of July, the Department advised that a longer term strategy would secure commitment to outcomes that may not be achievable within a 12 month period. A longer term strategy could, however, include short, medium, and longer term outcomes. The Department advised that it would still be its intention to report annually on progress against these outcomes. The Department has now provided the results of the consultation, which indicates support for the removal of the requirement of an annual strategy, with a three-year strategy being the preferred option. There was also support for the extension of the provision of support under the uh, relevant act beyond victims of human trafficking to potential victims of slavery, servitude and forced or compulsory labour. The Department intends to bring forward amendments via the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. And additionally, while it's not a statutory requirement, the Department has reaffirmed the commitment to publish an annual progress report on the strategy. So if members are content, um, to note then the summary of these responses and the next steps that have been outlined by the Department. Unless there's any further comments members need to make, then we will um, indicate our contentment and note the approach being taken. Great. Okay, thank you. Item 6 is the Draft Modern Slavery Strategy of 2020-21, the proposed consultation, and the Modern Slavery End of Year Report of 2019-20.
pages 94 to 162. The Department of Justice has provided the draft modern slavery strategy um, in line with section 12 of the Human, and Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act, um, which places a requirement on the department to publish an annual strategy. A draft consultation document on the strategy has also been provided. The purpose of the draft strategy is to raise awareness of human trafficking and slavery-like offences in Northern Ireland and to contribute to a reduction in the number of these offences. It must also cover the arrangements for cooperation between relevant organisations, provision as to the training and equipment for investigators, prosecutors and those dealing with victims and provisions aimed at raising awareness of the rights and entitlements of victims. As well as addressing these issues, it has been informed by statutory measures and requirements under the Human Trafficking Act 2015 and the Modern Slavery Act of 2015, current national and international priorities and commitments, the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner and Criminal Justice Inspection, as well as information available through the National Referral Mechanism and the National Crime Agency's strategic assessments of the nature and scale of human trafficking in the UK. The Department has indicated that this is a hybrid strategy which reaffirms the 2020-21 commitments and sets out a refreshed strategy for 21-22. This is because the 2021 strategy was not progressed prior to the restoration of the Assembly in January of this year and COVID-19 subsequently impacted on this work being taken forward. The Department has indicated that in the meantime arrangements and provisions for tackling modern slavery and human trafficking have been taken forward under the longer term commitments that were set out in the 2019-20 strategy. The Department has indicated that subject to the Committee's consideration of the draft strategy, a 12-week public consultation then will be launched before the end of October of this year. The Department uh, aims to publish the final strategy before the end of March next year. The draft strategy includes a report on progress um, of the 1920 strategy, um, which begins at page 125 of the meeting pack. This shows that a number of the actions are either in the red or the amber status, mm. so if members are content, um, we will ask the Department for more information on the actions that have been highlighted in the red or amber categories and the new timescales for when they are expected to be completed. So, um, Beyond that, members, if you are content then to note the draft strategy, proposed consultation, and that we would consider this matter further when the Department has provided the results of that consultation and their proposed way forward. Okay. Great, yeah. Item 7, um, mandatory retirement age for devolved judicial office holders. Proposed consultation, it's at pages 164 to 225. The Department plans to launch a consultation on proposals to raise the judicial mandatory retirement age of devolved tribunal members and lay magistrates um, in Northern Ireland to the age of either 72 or 75. This consultation will mirror a consultation <coughs> launched by the Ministry of Justice, which directly affects the expected um, judiciary in Northern Ireland for whom the Lord Chancellor is responsible. responsible. The Department has indicated the consultation um, seeks views on the options for raising the mandatory retirement age and on a proposal that would allow lay magistrates' appointments to be extended beyond the mandatory retirement age. The Department believes that allowing for extensions past the mandatory retirement age in legislation would provide a statutory basis and ensure a consistent approach for all extensions um, across courts and tribunals. Any change to the mandatory retirement age does require primary legislation and in order to keep open the option of maintaining parity between the court's judiciary and the devolved judiciary, the department subject to the outcome of the consultation may wish to consider coordinating a legislative approach for the expected and devolved judiciary. The Ministry of Justice is aiming to legislate by April of 2022, therefore taking into account pressures on the Assembly and this committee. Uh, during the remainder of this mandate, the Department may need to consider a legislative consent motion. Uh, subject to the views then of this committee, the Department intends to publish the consultation document as soon as possible for an eight-week consultation period. So if members are content, then we'll note the proposed <coughs> consultation and we can consider the matter uh, further when we have the uh, summary of that consultation and the proposed way forward. Members. 
Contact Rachel. Thanks. Obviously, Chair, at the start, I had declared um, an interest in this, um, but I have a number of questions on this matter. Um, in terms of the key issues which has been set out in the um, documents from the Department, there is a number of, you know, the proposal and key issues and about the consultation seeking views on the assumed benefits of a higher MRA. I'm wondering when the last time a recruitment drive was done for younger members of the lay magistrate. Um, I note that there doesn't seem to be any downsides put into this, um, which would be interested, obviously, to, to see whenever the consultation responses are in. Um, I would be wondering why the department have said, due to the relatively small numbers affected and lack of availability of data, they haven't been able to assess the estimated retention impact of a higher age. Well, surely they would have the data on who is currently in the lay magistrate and their dates of birth. Um, in terms of promoting judicial diversity as well, surely we need to be looking at recruiting younger uh, members of the lay magistrate and seeing if they're all section 75 compliant. Um, do we have a lot? Do we have young women, for example? Do we have people from the BAME community? Do we have a lay magistrate that actually reflects our society as it is? Um, so I have a number of questions from the department. I'm content to. Uh, wait until the, the consultation responses are in, but it's certainly something that I would be keen to look at, um, just to ensure that our, our judiciary is reflective of the society that uh, we're all part of. Okay. Yes, Linda. Just very quickly on the back of that, obviously the, the Minister suggests an LCM, and I've raised it in the Chamber before in relation to other issues, LCM would not be the preferred route, particularly if there are concerns around what is being brought in um, in Westminster, so we, we will need to look at that, but I'm content to leave that until we get the consultation responses. That's We'll ha be looking at a more rounded picture at that stage, I believe. Okay, Gemma? Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> Three strikes and you're out, boss. I, 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 I have been very conscientiously. <laughs> See, my wife's, my wife's called Emma. <laughs> so I, sh I should know. <laughs> Um, no, my, my point was just around, um, it is a public consultation that they're going to, but can we um, find out who, or, or if there's a targeted um, group for people, for the stakeholders that they're going to um, target the, the consultation towards as well, um, just to make sure that it's got the, the views of everybody that's affected by the judiciary? You know. well, I think that would be worth finding out who, who is the targeted consultation taking place with. Um, so all of the points are, are valid. I had that conversation earlier today with the committee clerk, you know, around the age demographics and the profile. And um, I noted that there's no downsides to it. <laughs> so, but yes, I'm happy that we explore <coughs> that once we get a response to the, the consultation and then the point that's been made on the, on the LCM is well made. Chair, would it be, could I, could just, just to get so we have a bit of information beforehand, could we write to the department and ask them uh, when the last recruitment drive was? Yeah. Just, it is my understanding that it was 15 years ago. Okay. And that could significantly have an impact on the way that the committee discusses moving forward after this consultation. Some of these posts, tribunals and so on, m may not lie within... The Department of Justice. I know the commu Department of Communities would have quite a number of tribunals and would have then a judicial interface with, with it. So, um, but listen, let's let's ask the questions. Okay. Okay. Then item eight: um, judicial pensions. Um, the proposed response to the McLeod and future pension reforms. Pages 227 to 394 have the relevant papers. The department is planning to undertake two consultation uh, consultations in respect of judicial pensions. The first covering how to address the McLeod judgment findings that the taper protections uh, extended to older judges as part of the 2015 reform of pensions amounting to direct age discrimination. Second, uh, covers reforms to judicial pensions and mirrors the proposals made in the Ministry of Justice consultation that was launched on the 16th of July of this year to um, resurrect the pension scheme for eligible justice judges and make some modernisation in terms of governance 
and uh, accountability arrangements. This would provide a better pension package for judges, which it is hoped will have a positive impact on recruitment and retention problems currently being encountered across the United Kingdom following the negative impact of the 2015 pension scheme reforms. The Department believes that it is important to uh, maintain parity between remuneration arrangements for devolved tribunals, judiciary in Northern Ireland and the court's judiciary, hence the reason for mirroring the MOG proposals. The Department has also indicated that there is a possibility that it may need to legislate by way of a legislative consent motion in relation to this. <coughs> the Department has indicated it intends to issue the consultation papers in mid-October or in the eight-week period and they should not uh, be public to um, members are content to note these proposed consultations. The LCM point, I assume, <coughs> stands on this issue as well. I'll take that as read. Um, and then we'll consider this when we get a summary of the responses. Emma. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, <coughs> do we have like an estimated cost that this is going to, um, from the department, what moving back to the old system is going to be? And if it's going to be a UK-wide scheme, are the Treasury going to con contribute anything to it? And if not, will it come out of the existing budgets for the Department of Justice? From memory, was it 0.7 million? Was the figure for the McLeod, <coughs> the McLeod issue, I think. That is the quantum. Although the McLeod judgment affects the entire public sector right across the UK, so this is just one element of it. Um, the figures on the other aspect of it, I don't have in front of me. So let's see if we can find that out. This is the uh, parity issue with the MOG approach. Um, yeah, well, let's try and get that information if we don't already have it. Okay. Members, sorry. Sorry, just, I just have one question. Um, and as you said, this does go right across the public sector, but in terms of those under the DOJ responsibility, is it just judges or are there other public servants who are affected by this? Yes, well, the police service, which we touched on um, whenever, I think it was um, the Deputy Chief Constable Mark Hamilton, uh -huh. spent a bit of time talking about that issue. So, you know, that's, that's right across the entire EOJ. Okay. Sure. It's an eight-week consultation, and I don't think we've ever got a, a full explanation or a satisfactory explanation from the department as to how they decide whenever they reduce that the consultation period from 12 to 8. So in this circumstance, and there may be, be a good rationale behind it, and if there is, I'm, I'm happy to hear it, but I would like to know why it is 8 weeks rather than 12, and it may be because it's a targeted smaller um, audience, but I, I would like to have the rationale behind why it's 8 weeks rather than, than 12. Okay, Rachel. Thanks, Chair. Just a quick was just on the costs. Um, at page 20 of the proposed consultation document, it said approximately 0.7 million, but then it goes on to say it doesn't include the costs associated with member contributions, income tax relief, judicial service award. So would, I don't know how you got the 0.7 million, if it's <coughs> not the full amount. Um, and certainly did raise this with the Chief Con whenever we had a um, discussion with him. You know, this is the pensions issue is a huge issue. It's coming down the line. So I think at some point we would need to get a briefing from the department um, on all of the all of the sort of affected sectors that come under the Department of Justice. Paul might know. Um, I'm not sure the Department of Finance is, is trying to take a collective approach around how we're addressing this. I'm not sure if it's come up in your committee, Paul. Uh, I can't think of a has even. Uh, you caught me blind there. Well, uh, I don't know. I could always raise it at the finance committee just to see. But uh, uh, clouds talked about. Yeah. But I don't know if there's this concerted effort to. Yeah. Sorry, Gemma. I just have one point. No, I remember we got a briefing on it months and months ago. Um, I can't even remember who that was from. But again, I don't know if there's. I don't think there was an actual action coming out of that. I think it was just a briefing on the issue. And Jim, Jim Wells would always raise it at the Fairness yeah. Committee. <laughs> yeah. Obviously keeping him up at night. Yeah. <laughs> no, he wasn't affected. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Linda. Can I suggest then that we write to the Finance 
committee or the finance department, whichever you think is more, I'm, I'm taking the finance department would be <laughs> more appropriate given that the committee um, aren't really sure what's happening with it. And see, is, I mean, if it goes right across the public sector, then it would make sense to me that there's a, you know, that there's an agreed approach in all departments to ensure that there aren't differences then in how it's being dealt with between, for example, PSNA and civil servants or council workers, whatever it is. So I think that it would be important that we, we do um, get a view from the finance department if they are going to try to move this forward in, in, a, in a unified and way across the board. I think it would be useful. I know we had done um, had quite a few conversations around it on, when I was on the policing board because there is quite, you know, it's, it's in terms of finances, it can have a, a major impact. But at the same time, there is a rights issue here. You know, the people are entitled to the money. So, but really the issue was around how far back it will go. I think it was almost agreed. Look, there is a rights issue and they're entitled to the money, but um, was a cut-off period across the water. I don't think we yet have anything like that in place. So we would need to find out that as well, what, what's happening in relation to that. Just to wait a bit further information, I'd asked the Minister of Finance about this um, and got a reply from him last week. Um, and he was to bring a paper with firm policy proposals <coughs> for consideration by the executive. And it would require a there would be cost control outcomes for each scheme once the details of these are known. So it's something that will be brought to the executive. Okay. Okay, well, listen, let's raise those issues that members have highlighted. Um, should we be asking for the, that information before the consultation goes out? I'm just, I'm concerned that, that the, I think there should be a, an approach across the board, and I also think we need clarity around um, the cut-off date before you're going out to consultation. Mm -hmm. Unless, unless we're confident that the consultation can happen without that information. See, my my understanding of the McLeod judgment is that those members impacted when they were moved in 2015 will all have the right to go back. Yep. At the point in which they were removed, um, and be restored to the scheme that they were in before they were put out of it, is, is, which the Court of Appeal upheld, and the government have now accepted, and are now. Um, this is about implementing the, the the ruling of the court on this issue. Um, okay. But listen, let, let's get. No, look, I, I'm I'm ha I'm happy if we're content that that, that we have the, enough information to allow the consultation to go ahead. I, I don't want to delay it on necessarily. Um, so if we if we get the information, then in line with that as well, and, and go ahead with. Who's what I would worry about, Chair, is the time it would take government to do this. Some of these people that have been affected uh, could be very in eight stages of their life. Yeah. And. If the government cogs turn slow on this, people will people will move on, they. Eh? Uh, and if you look at it cynically, that will lower the bill. So government really needs to turn this around quickly. Uh, there's been a judgment made in the courts. People have been wronged, and they need they need uh, redress to that. So um, sooner the better. No matter the bill. I'm saying I don't really want to delay it unnecessarily because I know that people will be sitting waiting and hoping that they're going to. Okay, well, members are content. We'll, we'll note then the proposed consultation and we'll look at the matter further, notwithstanding the questions members have raised, which we'll seek to get information on. Okay, item nine then the use of live link technology um, 396 to 461. At our meeting on the 10th of September, the committee considered the response from the OJ to its request for further information on the department's intention to proceed in relation to the use of live links technology for police interviews. Given that nearly half of respondents to the targeted consultation objected to its use, the committee also sought clarity on whether equality screening had taken place. On the proposals, the department's response indicates that the main concerns related to the DPNE's ability to understand the proceedings. And the respondents also wanted additional safeguards for the young and vulnerable. The department advised that it was its intention to consult separately on revisions to the statutory PS codes of practice that would incorporate uh, multiple safeguards to address the concerns that have been raised 
The response also provides is that the initial decision to screen out food quality impact assessment will be visited and amended to screen out with uh, screened out with mitigating actions. And having considered the department's response, the committee requested further information on the views of organisations on the intended safeguards and whether they are content, but they addressed the concerns raised. The department has responded, outlining that officials have contacted respondents who raised specific concerns around the safeguards and the use of live links for police interviews to explain that the statutory codes of practice uh, will provide a statutory basis for the proposed safeguards. The respondents were advised that it is the department's intention to engage with them further via a public consultation on the codes in order to assure them that their concerns are being taken into account. The department states that the intention to engage further has been welcomed by those respondents. The department has also advised that it intends to consult on the code amendments well in advance of commencement of the provisions for live links that will be included in the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill to ensure that they come into effect simultaneously. So if members are content um, with the Department's proposal to include provisions for all live link proposals, including for police interviews in the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill in light of the further information provided. No one members this is going to come back to us whenever legislation comes before us. That, that's really my, my point. I, I'm content that the department have come back and addressed a number of the issues that, that we had raised, Chair. Um, <coughs> and as you say, with the fact that it's going to be coming before us, so we can look at it then and see how. Okay. I'm, I'm content. Drag it out today. Okay, then. Item 10. The procedure standing order 110 to 16, pages 416 and 470. Um, these standing orders, which were agreed by the Assembly on the 31st of March this year, introduced temporary provisions to manage the impact of COVID-19 on Assembly business from the 31st of March to the 30th of September, uh, although this was recently extended until the 31st of March 2021. In respect of committee business, the temporary provisions do allow, as members know, for any member of the committee to attend remotely. They also provide for committee members to delegate their vote to another member of the committee and for a statutory committee to make decisions without holding a meeting. Um, the Committee on Procedures has written to the Assembly Committees seeking their views on these provisions provided for in these standing orders and has advised that it is content to consider any potential amendments um, to these standing orders that the committee may wish to suggest. Responses should be submitted by the 23rd of October and then the Committee for Procedures will publish submissions unless requested otherwise. So members, I know Linda chairs this committee, but it's whether so she wasn't familiar with it all, but it's whether any members have any other comments that you want to make that this committee could relay back to the Committee for Procedures. I think in the current circumstances they're reasonable. It's a different debate to be had if we can get back to normality as to the continuation of them and there may be some positives from them and there may be others that members don't want to see continued but I think that's for another day. So members are content and will indicate that the committee is content with the approach that's been taken by the procedures committee to extend it to the 31st of January. Great, yeah. So just a, one thing I would say Chair is that scrutiny is very important in this place and to if we do go back to a system where we have to accommodate things like an ad hoc committee or a, uh, what do they call it in the chamber? Our committee, ad hoc committee. Ad hoc committee. Then, then they need to assure that the windows of op the windows of time that they allocate to a committee is sufficient for committee business. There's been too many meetings of late where I've we've had to rush the agenda or leave the agenda to make way for another committee coming in behind us, which th then leaves them late for, for commencing business. So there has to be proper sufficient time allocation for committees to meet when we're sharing rooms. To be fair, I suppose the Committee for Procedures, that's not their role, but I should say it was raised, that it's been an item on the Chairman Liaison Group um, about accessibility and um, that very issue and seeking to enhance <coughs> the rooms that are suitable for us to hold meetings. Um, so that's something that I know that body is due to get a, an update um, to get greater access to, for example, the Assembly Chamber. Is sitting there unused outside of Mondays and Tuesdays. So um, there's a pay, there's a course of work um, that's being looked at, and I know the assembly staff are trying to expedite that as soon as possible. Um, 
correspondence then, members. There's eight items on pages 472 to 795 and one item on page 6 of the table pack. And I'm just going to draw attention to um, a couple of items. Item 4 in terms of the correspondence in the meeting pack is the criminal inspection uh, report into the detention of persons in police custody. And the report makes six strategic recommendations, one of which is the responsibility of the department to take forward and seven operational recommendations which will build on existing effective partnerships and deliver better police custody services when implemented. So Jenny has recommended the department should prioritise and secure support for required legislative reform to implement long-standing Northern Ireland Law Commission recommendations on the right to bail for children and young people and make changes to the Police and Criminal Evidence Order 1989, which make provisions for alternative accommodation for children charged with an offence and provide clarity for custody officers on the detention of children and young people. Um, so if members are content, um, I recommend that we ask the Department for information on how it is intending to take that recommendation forward. Okay. Um, then one other item um, in the table pack, members will be aware of then, there's a letter from the Minister for Justice that was received last night advising the committee that members of the Southeastern Health Care team working in Milligan Prison have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, the Minister has provided a further update uh, which has been tabled for members today and the figure of positive tests has now increased to four and as a result we now have 17 members of the health care team and two members of the prison service um, self-isolating and uh, this morning Two prisoners presented as symptomatic and as a precaution they've been placed in isolation. Um, so both of those uh, individuals have been tested and those results are awaited. The South Eastern Trust are deploying resources to uh, McGilligan Prison and the prison service will take whatever action uh, they deem necessary to ensure the safety of staff and prisoners and as a consequence in-person visits to McGilligan have been temporarily suspended. Uh, the Minister indicates that the situation is fluid, um, but she has went out of her way to provide information to this committee um, both last night and this morning. So obviously, members, it's a situation that's of concern and we we'll want to get regular updates. Um, but to be fair to the Department, we have received that. Linda and then Rachel. Suppose it's something to be considered. The Minister might want to make a a statement or a statement in relation to this at the start of the week. I mean, over the weekend, this could obviously um, escalate. It's concerning when you, when you talk about the numbers. I know that the biggest numbers are among the, the healthcare staff in, in terms of those who are isolating. But even that in itself, obviously, is, is concerning. <coughs> so I think that, I mean, the prison service have done really good work to keep, you know, to keep COVID out of the prisons to date. And... Unfortunately, now they do have when it's in. They knew this when it when it got into the prison system. Trying to manage it in there would be extremely difficult, and we know that the prison is reflective of what's happening, um, in the re in the rest of six counties. So, I think that it would, as you say, the minister has given us this opportunity. Oh, Apologies. Sorry. Right. There's maybe just some interference coming through the. Speakers, um, she has given us an update at the earliest opportunity, and I'm grateful for that, and hope that continues. But it might be useful to to have a, a statement, just to give us a, a full as full an update as possible, as full a detail of what's happening in the prison. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in Rachel, and then I'm gonna bring in Doug and Sinead, and I'm not sure if the interference is coming through the Starley facility, so. Both Doug and Sinead can just, maybe they are muted, but if they can, just temporarily in case that's what the cause is, um, then I'll, I'll bring you in in due course. So, Rachel. Thanks, Chair. No, certainly um, welcome uh, welcome the fact that we've got um, the information here and certainly quite concerning, but it is reflective of what is happening um, throughout Northern Ireland. But in terms of the, the 17 members of the healthcare team, is you know is there is there sufficient resources been put back in then you know are people going to be able to go back in under this situation and, and provide the health care in in the prison 
Um, because obviously that's another issue. If if they're if it's not um, if they're if they're not sort of at full capacity, then for you know potential issues within the prison themselves. But certainly, I would welcome a, a statement um, on that. Okay, um, Doug Beatty. Chair, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I hope you can can hear me. Um, Chair, yeah, I just wanted to just want to just put on record. I mean, I think this is exactly the way business should be done. Is that last night we got a letter of a really important issue, and then we got an update today about what is happening in our prisons. Um, it's absolutely right that that this um, committee receives that information, and you, as a chair, gets that, so we have the ability to discuss it. Um, but what concerns me is. Is that we are willing to put out a, a letter saying that staff have caught COVID, but we're not willing to inform this committee when two prisoners die in custody. Um, uh, and I think that has to be raised again. Uh, and I don't think time um, doubles the impact of this. And that's simply that this committee was not informed that two prisoners died in custody three days after uh, the second one died. We were, we were talking about it because of whispers uh, on social, social media. Uh, and I would just put on record, if this had been deaths in police custody, um, we wouldn't have the same uh, lax attitude to informing committees and policing boards. But for some reason, we have on this. So uh, where I commend this is the right way to do business, to make sure we know what is going on. Um, uh, I do say that there was a serious failing on, on behalf of the Justice Minister not telling us um, that two prisoners had died in custody. Um, thank you. I'll pick up on that in a moment. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, this was disappointing and concerning. Obviously, it is reflective of what's happening in society, and um, I think we've done well to keep COVID out of prisons to date, but perhaps um, it would be reassuring now if the Minister could give a more wholesome statement in regard to resources uh, to ensure that the health requirements are still being met. And I just want to take a moment to wish all those affected well um, and for speedy recovery, but also for the families um, outside who will no doubt be very concerned, um, just to make sure that adequate resources has been redirected in terms of then if you know visitation can't happen, that, that laptops and that are available to maybe take an increase in demand in McGilligan for those virtual visits. Um, Gordon Dunn. Thanks, Chair. No, I would agree. And I think we all welcome the fact that this information has come through very promptly. I think that's positive and a bit of progress. Um, we do know that the provision is, is done, health care is done by the South Eastern Trust, which from the South Eastern Trust area to McGilligan is, is quite a distance, and I assume people travel there <coughs> to it. So I suppose that's one of the risks that that we all need to be aware of. But um, from our previous question of the governor, the prison, I understand the trust, they are responsible for, for the provision of care and fund it accordingly. So um, as already has been said, we would seek assurances, and it has been mentioned to be fair, that you know the trust are putting in adequate resources here to, to cover the health care. So, I think it once again re-emphasises the risk is out there for all of us in relation to COVID. It's real. It's in our schools. It's in the community. And, and I'm sure we hear about it every day. And I, this is just the reality of it. There's a risk for all of us. And I think we all need to be, as leaders, we need to be shown an example. We need to be vigilant and, and encourage all those we come in contact to take the necessary measures to try and, and reduce the risk. So... Um, it is of concern, but we, we welcome the fact that we'll be notified in good time. Thanks, Chair. Gordon, Linda. Just a, a quick point in relation to it. I, I think that sometimes we we think we have this false impression of who prisoners are that they're you know that they're young and fit and healthy and you know that they're out robbing houses. But some of our, our prisoners are quite elderly. They're in very poor health. So I would. Um, just support what Sinead is saying in terms of the families outside. These are people who, who could be potentially be very vulnerable to becoming very ill through COVID. So I do think that we need to find out from the Minister what has been done to, to protect those and, and the staff that are working in the prison. Okay, well, um, 
Let, let's correspond back with the Minister and um, we'll put on record our appreciation for the speedy way in which we've been informed about this, but there are further um, questions that members would have in respect of this and she may wish to consider making a statement then um, to the Assembly um, next week about this. Chair, just on the visits thing, could we just get clarification that the, the online system is still available, which we, we heard quite a bit about some months ago, that that is now uh, up and running and that will be available as an option if visiting it is not allowed? Yeah, well, there's a number of points that members have raised which we can relay to the Minister um, and we'll include that one into it, but in a, in a more general sense, I think if she was able to... Um, make a statement, and particularly if things deteriorate over the course of the weekend, then um, that's something that she should make a call on as to whether or not a statement should be made on Monday or Tuesday. Um, and on, on the issue that Doug mentioned in, a, in a, a wider sense, I think it is worth exploring what is the, the criteria for informing this committee in particular, because you know, I noted the Minister's response on this issue, um, that in respect of one of the the individuals that had passed away, that that family hadn't wanted to have information released to the public, which is fair enough um, if that's the, the decision of the family. Um, but there obviously has to be a way in which we as a committee and members can receive information rather than um, through phone calls and people that are working in the prison service and so on and picking it up. There, there, there should be a better protocol, I think, in place that we as members can receive that information, even if it's in a in confidence basis. And if members are content, um, we'll raise that with the minister that we would like to um, explore with her a way in which we can get that kind of information um, for members' benefit, even if it is in confidence. Doug, you had raised this before, so I'm just suggesting that as a way forward. Yeah, sure. I, I'm more than happy uh, with that. Um, I think we do need to formalise this because we as a scrutiny committee at least need to know. Um, we can even discuss it um, not in public session, you know, so there is an opportunity to talk about this. And we have to bear in mind that these deaths, these two deaths occurred off the back of complaints made about understaffing of night custody officers. So, so the, you know, if you put the two and two together, you can see why we could see a concern. Um, and I guess that's why I was so disappointed that we weren't told um, what was going on. But, but I absolutely with your approach, um, Chair. In confidence probably is important because we do have to respect the wishes of, of families not to have this put out into the public. But for that reason, maybe it would be good for us to have the information so that if somebody does pick it up through social media, that they then don't run with that not knowing, in the absence of knowing, that a family actually don't want any publicity around the, the fact that their loved one has died, because these can be very extremely sensitive issues, and for a number of different reasons, and I think that it is important for that reason that we actually have the information, so that we don't maybe run with something mm -hmm. against a family's wishes because they, they should be, at the end of the day, they're the, per, they're the family that have lost a loved one, and we have to prioritise their feelings in, in all of this as well. OK, Paul? Yeah, Chair, there is absolutely no excuse at all for the Department not to give information down to the Scrutiny Committee, either confidential, uh, confidentially or transparent and open. And there's absolutely no excuse, and they do use this excuse from time to time, but there's absolutely no reason for that. Um, and, of course... We also have asked a question which is still not the answered yet, but still timely enough that uh, we don't even know what the information that the Minister gets from the Department. Uh, so again, information is critical, and I'm not sure yet that the culture has changed sufficiently enough to ensure that we do we are able to do our job in a professional manner. Okay, well listen, let's raise this um, in terms of the way I've suggested um, with the Minister, and we can take it from there. Um, are members content we action the other items in correspondence as outlined in the clerk's memo? Agreed. Agreed and yeah. I have no chairman's business. Is there any other business members want to raise? I have oh. one issue, Chair. Uh, I don't know if we're aware as a committee if we've ever had a briefing on it. Uh, maybe I haven't, I've missed it. But there was a thing called a support hub uh, that came into play a couple of years ago, three or four years ago. The Department of Justice rolled out the the community safety division rolled out to, to councils uh, 
some funding, not much by the sounds of things, but it was funding to establish a multi-agency support hub, which council led on. Now that had all the players, the community safety partnership would have had, all the players on that, and it was to deal with the most vulnerable people in a council area. Issues, victims around child abuse, domestic abuse, um, people had mental health issues, some of the more unique issues around hoarding and untidiness even. Some of those community problems that people face from time to time, maybe their neighbour or whatever. And this regional hub, this support hub, have been able to deal with them. Now, I don't think all councils have them, but the offer was there funding to roll these out. And in my area, Mid and East Antrim, they seem to be working quite well. <coughs> now, to be fair on the department, I think the department did say at the very start that this funding would only be in place for three years. Uh, and that may well be for good reason. They maybe wanted to find out the worth or the benefit of these support hubs and indeed if they even worked. It seems to be the case that they do work pretty well now. But it now does seem to be the case that the Department of Justice is pulling the funding. Now, in the letter that they've sent to the councils, it states that the funding was only going to be in place for three years, in which time it was anticipated that the hubs would have proved their worth. Such funding could be subsumed within normal running costs of council. So basically, they've set this up thinking it's a good idea. It was a good idea. And now justice is saying, right, council, good idea. You fund it yourselves. Now, I don't think there's a lot of money involved. I would like to find out how much money is involved what cost-benefit analysis have been done uh, on these uh, support hubs and if it is a good idea and, and it saves justice agencies money, why would it still not be a good idea to keep the funding going, albeit a very small part? Now, I'm not saying we should fund things forever, but if they're actually efficient and effective, why would you not fund them? So it's just to find out more information uh, I know Katie Taylor is the head of the Community Safety Division. Now, she wasn't at the time it was ruled out, but maybe if we could have a correspond with the Dallow or to Katie Taylor just to see exactly where, they, where their mind is on this and whether they do think it's a sufficient idea to keep these running. And if they do, why then are they leaving it to councils? Okay, Linda and Rachel. First thing, I support what Paul is saying. I know that the, the partnership committee and the policing board kept a very close eye on the hubs because originally there only was, I, th I think the very first one was in Derry and Strabane and then Mitten East Antrim might have been the next one and a number of councils have only got them in recent and council areas have only got them in very recent times and they do work you know I'm not saying they solve all problems or they answer to everything but they have their role and they do work so I do think that they are something that would be should be asking for, for funding to continue for I think councils would, would struggle I know that there was some, and, and it might be worth writing to the policing board as well on this basis, they, they were looking at you know, whether it would be funded through PCSP's money and, and things like that. So we probably need a view from the policing board as well on on what their feeling is around it because DOJ may well try to pass it on to somewhere else other than the council. So whether it be you know, money goes to PCSP, they can choose what they do with that. So they remove something else that they're doing to pay for this. But it wasn't massive font, and you're right, it really only was around Secretariat. Um, so the, the, there wasn't a big, a big font requirement because the hub literally is about people who are already in place coming together and dealing with, with very particular issues and individuals really was the, the main issue. So I think that we should write both DOJ and the policing board if, if that's possible. Rachel? Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree um, with both there, but uh, I'm aware whenever it was on PCSP in council, this had come up, and there is, seems to be a bit of a disparity between different council areas, so I would certainly, as part of any writing to um, whatever agency um, and group, is you know has this been rolled out consistently across all councils, because how can you make an analysis and an assessment of its effectiveness if everyone's at different stages? Um, so certainly would welcome a lot more information on that. That was been discussed a couple of years ago, and I don't know if it had ever fully okay. rolled out. Are members content then that we, we raise this? Good. Okay. okay, well, then, if there's no other business members, um, we'll meet next week. Sorry, Chair, can I just raise one other item? Yes. 
Yeah. Chair, I'm just aware that there there's a growing grey area um, regarding COVID and enforcement work. And I wonder, has there been clear direction given from the executive or the Minister for Health to the PSNI in terms of what's expected of them in the weeks ahead? Um, because it is becoming increasingly confusing and there appears to be different messages from different ministers on what is to be expected. And I think it's only fair that we, I suppose, scrutinise that what is being asked of the PSNI is reasonable and resourceable. Yeah, it, it likely the Justice Minister is leading on this group that has been um, touching on enforcement issues, and she mentioned that in the Assembly this week. Um, so I don't know what the outcome of the executive will be today, um, but on that broader issue around where there's enforcement and what the police are doing and the criteria that's being used for police operational decisions. It's something we did touch on members with the Chief Constable uh, last week around this issue. Um, so more than happy to engage with the, the Minister if, if members wish to write for greater, greater clarity from the Minister for Justice as to how all of this is being navigated um, and considered by the executive. Um, I'm happy that we would do that. Linda? Can we ask, I mean, whenever both the Assistant Chief Constable and the Chief Constable were in, they talked about the three E's, so there was engagement, encouragement, enforcement, and I am a wee bit concerned that the first two E's are being dropped in some circumstances and straight to enforcement. So just on the back of what Sinead's saying, if we can find out, is that still... The case and you know are the first two e's still being used because you have to engage with people to find out if there's a reason why you know a genuine reason whether it is that they've misunderstood and i mean obviously that will have to be a, a call for the psna and don't envy them their job and that whether somebody's you know being totally truthful with them but i think that the, the first two e's we as far as we were told were still in place and i'd like to just be given some reassurance around whether and if it isn't then the rationale and, and and we'll have to look at that but okay members we'll raise it okay is that everybody <coughs> right okay well then we'll meet next week at two o'clock thank you sure. this is the northern ireland assembly committee room 30. this is the northern ireland assembly committee room 30.